Hello and welcome to the Asian Society of International Law 101, a space where we discuss international law scholarship from Asia, about Asia and international law scholarship in general. A huge welcome to our guest speaker today, Professor Surya Subedi QC. And the aim of our conversation today is to discuss his new book, Human Rights in Eastern Civilizations. Welcome, Surya. Thank you very much, Mabluda. Good to see you. And thank you for organizing this program. Thank you. So, Congratulations on publishing yet another book. And I do admire the pace at which you produce these very important contributions. And I still think back uh, to that tome you've written on international investment law and policy, which was instrumental in building my understanding about international investment law. But this is an entirely different uh, project, this is an entirely different book, Human Rights and Eastern Civilization. So I wanted to ask, what was the impetus for this particular project? Was there any specific event or occasion that prompted you to conceive this book? Uh, thank you very much, Mabluda, first of all, for your kind words uh, about my previous publication, uh, International Investment Law, Reconciling Policy and Principle. With regard to this book, I have been teaching a course in Lee's called Global Governance Through Law. Then I realized the limitations of the curriculum that we are recommending to our students. Uh, there were not many publications available which examine the contribution made by non-Western civilizations to the development of modern international human rights agenda. My um, uh, concern about the lack of uh, adequate literature about other civilizations. That was number one. Number two, there has been a debate going on globally now at various universities, especially in the United States and Western Europe, about the need to decolonize the curriculum. When we say human rights, what do we mean by that one? Do, you, do we mean only the human rights that are included in the nine or 10 core international human rights treaties concluded under the auspices of the United Nations or go a bit beyond that one. There is no globally or universally accepted definition of human rights itself in the first place. So I thought, do Eastern civilizations have certain norms of human rights embedded in them? I I'm a person who was educated in Sanskrit until the age of 13. So I thought, hey, if I don't write this book, who else? I have this knowledge of Sanskrit um, literature to a certain extent and philosophy, born and brought up in, in a country which has a mixed heritage. In Nepal, we don't see much distinction between Hinduism and uh, Buddhism. They are part and parcel of the same religion. Buddha was born in Nepal, and Nepal was traditionally a place for meditation, contemplation for religious figures in ancient times within Hinduism. With, aware of that heritage, I thought I should investigate a bit more and learn myself what is the idea behind it, what are the core messages in Hinduism and Buddhism, and how compatible they are with the modern international human rights agenda. Number one, Number two, what contribution have they made? Of course, when we say human rights, people are associated with the United Nations, especially after the establishment of the United Nations. Of course, we can go back to the Magna Carta of 1215, the English Bill of Rights, the French Declaration of Human Rights, the American Declaration of Independence, and so on and so forth. But can we go a bit beyond that one, further back in history? prior to the colonization period, even prior to the Magna Carta, were there any norms in different societies? The Asian civilizations, mainly Hinduism and Buddhism, flourished around the 6th, 7th century BC. Buddha was born around that time. And the religious figure Krishna was active around that time. Confucius was active around that time. 
around fifth sixth century there is a lot of debate going on these people were challenging the traditional dogma and creating new ideas coming up with a new philosophies i thought oh, what contribution did they have to make to the advancement of human civilization and what impact did they have on colonial powers in the first place and then western countries in the second place uh, in the aftermath of that one that was my inquiry and also the black life matters the the sort of debate going on so these are three four things contributed to the idea of writing a book on this topic and the lockdown the restrictions also contributed being confined to my home uh, i thought i should devote that time to write a book in this area and of course i had been developing these ideas for a long time but the culmination of it was during the lockdown period uh, due to the covid-19 thank you uh, that's a fascinating uh, back story so as you say the book traces human rights in scriptures and practices of hinduism and buddhism and you you seek to assess their influence in the contemporary understanding of human rights including in the states of um the, the states that have hindu buddhist heritage could you give us one example of how human rights manifest themselves in these ancient religions and also an example of their contemporary influence thank you there are three things i i saw in the religious scriptures of both hinduism and buddhism number one universalism universal outlook to the outside world number two tolerance and number three non violence um these were the basic principles that informed the religious scriptures there was a great deal of emphasis placed on personal liberty um, you as an individual could exercise as much personal liberty as possible except for taking interest in political affairs so far as other matters of society and private life was concerned people enjoyed in antiquity great deal of personal liberty and when the colonial powers came to asia they benefited from that approach embracing diversity embracing allowing foreigners to come and enjoy the liberty that the local people themselves were enjoying that enable them to have a foothold and expand that foothold and eventually colonize the countries in asia that um, and then the colonial people who came to asia also realized hey there is something to be learned from here that was the time very many european countries were engaged in long religious wars uh, within christianity and they saw in asia hey is a different they do believe in certain religious values but they allow enough uh, flexibility within it so the degree of tolerance many western scholars have admitted that one that the degree of tolerance practiced in asian societies at the time pre colonization period when they had just come as the traders they said wow this is something you europe could learn from asian countries and then the principle of tolerance they introduced because some of the colonial people for instance hugo grosser the father of international law father of modern international law that's what i would say also was a legal advisor to the dutch east india company he traveled extensively to the far east the arabia then some of the ideas behind his writing also have been influenced by the practice of a peaceful maritime trade that existed between the nations of the time in that part of the world and many other scholars have commented on the degree of tolerance that existed in those societies could be replicated in europe of the time that's a tremendously uh, fascinating insight indeed into this intersection between human rights and that the the values uh, eastern civilization values and how they underpin the functioning of human rights both now and back then even in pre-colonial and post-colonial periods one of the questions your book raises is whether the contemporary notions of asian values or cultural relativism have their basis in hinduism and buddhism and i thought that is a very interesting and extremely important question so could i ask you so are asian values an invention of 
autocratic rulers, as you say, autocratic, autocratic rulers of Asia, the rules um, created to justify the systems of governance, which imposes restrictions on the exercise of universal rights and freedoms by the people of those countries. So what are these Asian values in your understanding? Uh, of course, every society is different. It has its own values. Every nation state has its own values. They take tremendous pride in that one. That's why they are separate individual states. Having acknowledged that diversity, the difference, when it comes to human rights, what are the fundamental principles behind human rights? The fundamental principles behind human rights are universalism, personal liberty, tolerance, secularism, the list could go on. The, these four or five are core values. These values do exist, did exist in Asian societies as well. For instance, there was a time when Buddhism was the state religion, both in India and China. It had a tremendous influence in the civilizations of those countries, in the growth of civilization in those countries. If you look at the Buddhist scriptures, Buddhist scriptures are informed by Hindu scriptures. And Hindu scriptures have these principles which allow people to exercise their, nowadays we call human rights, but at the time we could say personal liberty or civil liberty. That's how you know, the foundation for human modern concept of human rights is basically civil liberty or personal liberty. There was enough of it in the built in the Buddhist and Hindu religious scriptures. Therefore, I am not one of those who subscribes to the idea of Asian civilizations being an excuse to escape from international human rights obligations arising out of international treaties concluded under the auspices of the United Nations, number one. And number two, since 1960s, mid 1960s, developing countries had a numerical majority within the United Nations. Many of the international human rights instruments, there are 130 or so altogether. Of course, there are 19 core, for instance, the ICCPR, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights were adopted in 1966, just at the time when developing countries mainly from Asia and Africa, had a numerical majority within the United Nations. The, the first United Nations Treaty, with a provision for monitoring and protection mechanism, the Convention Against the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, was the first in instrument, with a mechanism for individual petition. And that was concluded on be, uh, due to the efforts made by Asian African states. Therefore, when people say human rights are Western concepts, I'm not happy with that one because the Asian countries, African countries themselves have contributed to the advancement of human rights since 1966, mid-1960s. That's the second reason. And third reason is wherever you are, whether you are Asian or African or European, the underlying ideas, the desire to enjoy your freedom is common to all. And these core international human rights treaties do nothing more than articulating what the common desire, common values of different societies are. Therefore, in my opinion, the idea, yes, Asian countries have certain Asian values, family oriented, more disciplined, respect for elderly, um, um, a, a sort of a, um, greater respect for religious heritage, so on and so forth are there. But when it comes to political matters, when it comes to right to governance, democratic governance, other things, this has been used as a, an excuse to deny the people the freedom that they should enjoy under the treaties that these countries themselves have ratified or contributed to the conclusion of them. The, the, your reflections on this question do resonate with my own uh, evolving understanding of how international norms in the field where I research international economic law have been um, have benefited from contributions from 
countries of the global south, because it is often argued that the countries of the global south are rule takers, not rule makers. But I'd like to advocate a much more sort of broader understanding of what it in means to make international law in the sense that you can not only articulate those norms and indeed your example of the United Nations General Assembly in 1960s and 1970s and the majority which developing countries enjoyed therein is one really good example of how certain significant changes in articulating international uh, law and in its rules were made at the time but also international law is made through acts of resistance contestation and other multiple forms of engagement so this is indeed something that resonates with my own uh, scholarly evolving understanding of how international law works and that allows us to segue to the next question that I wanted to ask, and that's how does the book fit with the recent calls to decolonize international law and scholarship? And this is something that you mentioned earlier, as something that the, the idea that decolonization of international law and scholarship was one of the factors that inspired you to, to write this book. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, what you said before, beautifully, the contribution made by um, Asian African countries to the de development of international economic law and uh, has not been properly documented, analyzed, and you are one of those who are doing it. I'm very pleased about it, and I thank you for that one. Uh, with regard to the book, yes, I think it has already generated some interest uh, amongst the intellectual community globally. Um, my idea was to expand the horizon of people in terms of thinking about the concept of human rights in the first place, not just limiting themselves to the United Nations human rights agenda, going a bit beyond that one in a wider context, in a much earlier historical context. How have we come here? What was the background behind it? Therefore, the um, curriculum in very many universities around the globe is limited, in my opinion mainly the discourse within Western philosophical religious tradition, not going beyond that one. So uh, what I'm trying to do, going back to the 6th century BC, even before that one, the time when the Rig Veda was composed, although the various estimates vary, but around 1415 BC, the main religious scripture in Hinduism was composed that influenced Buddha when he himself was seeking um, enlightenment, how he could address the misery that people were suffering around him. What would be the best way forward for humans to live? Is happy people, both happiness inside and outside happiness, inner happiness, that was his focus. If you are a happy person within yourself, then other things will follow. That's called Nirvana, achieving Nirvana. That's what he was trying to promote. Exposing these days, for instance, mindfulness, um, meditation. Uh, these are basically Eastern concepts which have caught on and become global phenomena. Yoga, you know, these the three, four things have become global phenomena. But what is the main message behind them? Why they were conceived? How they were developed? Nowadays, people don't even remember yoga was an ancient Hindu practice or Buddhist practice. Mindfulness basically is based on Buddhist teachings. So what are the values there? And that I thought will be a contribution to decolonizing. When I say decolonizing, I do not mean taking out some of the books there. They should be there, but including more. When I say decolonizing, I'm saying more inclusive approach a richer list of reading for students who are trying to understand the roots of human rights, how they came into being. So expanding the scope of the curriculum by including literature from other civilizations, in this case, Eastern civilizations. That's what I'm trying to say. 
Absolutely. And again, that resonates with me and that, that's my burgeoning understanding of the whole decolonization of the curriculum project is that it needs to be about pluralizing and diversifying yeah. the scholarship base and also pluralizing and diversifying the, the sources that we use in, in teaching um, our students in any fields of international law. I understand that your book, Human Rights in Eastern Civilizations, has been inspired by your previous work as a UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in Cambodia. Can you share with us one memorable event or one memorable encounter that um, has influenced your thinking on the subject and how it influenced you? Thank you, Mabluda. When I was appointed by the United Nations as the Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in Cambodia during my first fact-finding mission to the country, I was advised to go to see a museum sort of place called Killing Fields, where the skeleton of so many people, they were killed by the Khmer Rouge regime led by Pol Pot. That I said, this is a country predominantly a Buddhist country. If you go to Angkor Wat, it's a beautiful place. It's a fascinating place. Rich history there. You can see the blend of Hinduism and Buddhism inscribed on the walls of Angkor Wat, various temples. Initially, it was built as a Hindu temple. Later, it became a Buddhist temple. Cambodia is a country with a rich cultural heritage, religious heritage. How come these people became so violent and started to kill so many people? What went wrong here? Was it political ideology or the, they had forgotten their heritage? What was it? That was my inquiry. That was the trigger point for me to investigate more about the impact of Eastern civilizations on the daily lives of the people. For instance, the massacre, people say genocide, the estimates vary from 1.5 million to 3 million people. We don't have the exact figure how many people were killed. Not many people were documented that time. But it was a mass scale atrocity there. How did it come about? Was it due to communism? Pol Pot was supposedly a ultra leftist communist leader and the Khmer Rouge, a brutal ultra leftist organization, or there was something in it. That was the thing that inspired me to think more about the heritage of the country, both cultural, religious, and political heritage how it is impacting on people's daily lives now. Then I thought I should explore more. And the second thing was that when I went to Cambodia, the first meeting I had with the Cambodian Prime Minister, Mr. Hun Sen, uh, during my first meeting with him, he said, um, Professor, welcome to Cambodia, but I hope you will not be as ignorant as your predecessors. By that he meant, that those who came to Cambodia did not understand Cambodia's reality as a nation state. Then I thought, what he meant by that one? Later I uh, realized that he meant that UN special reporters came to the country to promote Western human rights agenda. But Cambodia being a country with a rich cultural religious heritage in which the basic foundations of human rights were already there, was the United Nations Special Rapporteur promoting Western agenda or reviving the Eastern agenda or the Eastern heritage or the Eastern history, civilization. So I wanted to write something which would enable people to understand and appreciate their own cultural heritage. Even in China today, they say many people are critical of China's human rights record. They say that Chinese uh, 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 approach to international governance could be different in due course from the system that we have in place. But I go back in history and say China's psyche, the national psyche, the whole Chinese civilization was also founded on number of things, including Buddhism. Therefore, there is not much difference in the Chinese history as well. As I said, once China, the Buddhism was the state religion of China for a long time. And many Chinese scholars in ancient past were inspired by Buddhist philosophies of nonviolence, tolerance, personal liberty, secularism. 
Buddha himself was not a religious figure. He basically he was a rebel against the established dogma, and he said to people, "You don't have to worship idols, and you know you have to be um, inquiring within yourself who you are as a human being. You are a light of your own, so kindle that light." That was his message. Therefore, my idea was in, was to write something uh, informed by Hindu Buddhist religious scriptures, bringing to light unearthing what was in existence in those scriptures for the convenience of the modern reader who will not be able to read in Sanskrit. I have that uh, sort of a facility, the ability to read. the sanskrit scriptures myself without relying on secondary sources without relying on poor translations of uh, religious scriptures so i thought i would be a quite an effective author to write about it that was what i produced this book thank you it is very astonishing how certain personal encounters and events can shape and reshape our understanding of what we do and influence how we go forward and i was also thinking when you mentioned those inscriptions on the walls of buddhist temples in cambodia how amazing it would be to use even a photograph of that Absolutely. in teaching Absolutely. human rights and to Absolutely. to make it real for students and anyone in the classroom yeah. as to what you're talking about and that would probably have a dramatic effect yeah. and um what i also wanted to ask you is obviously the question about readership so beyond the usual suspects that is human rights scholars and those focusing on international law in asia in general who are your intended readers for this book for human rights in eastern civilization if you were to pitch this book to someone outside your own epistemic community what would you say uh, i would say broadly speaking human rights defenders in asia across asia uh, number 2 uh, philosophers uh, number 3 um, people in religious studies uh, law and religion and perhaps some general members of the public who wants to know what their own heritage is rather than be carried away by this idea that human rights are western agenda and then they somehow should be challenged or asia should come up with its own definition of you know international governance human rights so and so forth so some general members of the public should also be interested in a book of this nature thank you well Congratulations again on publishing this tremendously important book and I hope it becomes disseminated and the ideas you advocate there receive much needed attention and I hope that both students scholars practitioners and the general public uh, enjoys and learns from reading this uh, really important piece of scholarship thanks for being our guest today at asian uh, society 101 conversations and i hope we have another opportunity to have a similar conversation perhaps on another book or article that you publish thank you so much mabluda for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts with uh, our viewers and uh, it has it has been a pleasure for me and i thank you for your time Thank you for joining us at the Asian Society of International Law 101 and watch the space for future conversations. Mm -hmm.